always asking is what I think I like most about my favorite author, A.S. King. She comes at her books with such novelty and openness, as if she herself is asking her characters, what are you gonna do next? How will that affect and change your life and the story we're telling? I think it's something we should all be asking ourselves constantly. So I'm making this video as an ode to not only somebody who has shaped me as a writer, but as a person through her work. Thanks in advance, Amy. Now let's hop into it. I'd say the overarching theme of what I love about the novels we're about to dive into is voice. Having a unique narrator or narrators is what makes them so intriguing. You get to look at situations from a whole new point of view. And if the author does a good job at crafting her character or characters, that only furthers the point of you being able to see why their points of view or decisions as legitimate for them, even if you wouldn't think or do the same yourself. You could be deaf, narrating a little girl's life as she starts stealing and trying to learn how to read illegal books in Germany in World War II. Or you could be a Filipino-American boy who goes back to the Philippines to try and solve the murder of his cousin in the midst of a drug war and a horrible dictatorship. A.S. King does the voice of her narrator so well that even though her stories are vastly different, you still get a great perspective on each. Let me show you how with three of her books as examples. Everybody Sees the Ants is a story about a main character named Lucky, whose grandfather was a prisoner of war in the Vietnam War. He never returned home. And Lucky's grandmother, on her deathbed, leaves him one final plea. Find your grandfather. After this comes countless stress on Lucky to help at a task that has been so hopeless for people with a lot more resources than him. Couple that with some pretty horrific bullying and then there's the nightmares. Lucky constantly gets dragged back into Vietnam where the only thing that's able to talk to him are the ants all around him. Vera Dietz should not be ignored because Please Ignore Vera Dietz is a lovely novel one that got me reading ASK. This actually has four points of view, Vera, her dad, and two others I find most compelling. The first one is a pagoda on top of a hill, but this is where some of the high schoolers that are most associated with the main dilemma of the book hang out. For being a pillar of spirituality, this pagoda is anything but. It's extremely unfiltered and says quite a few things I wouldn't expect a building to say if it could think or talk. This is a great way to read about different characters in the novel who don't necessarily need a point of view, but they need to be heard from. This is still one of my favorite characters to date. Yes, one of my favorite characters is a building. Then there's the main dilemma of the book, which I mentioned earlier. It has to do with Vera's ex-best friend, Charlie, mysteriously dying. 
I mean, I say mysteriously, but our main protagonist actually knows exactly how he died. And we get to see Charlie as a spirit watch Vera come to terms with it throughout the book. We see her pain and suffering, her turn towards alcohol, and her pushing away people who can and want to help her. Half of it is through her eyes, half of it is through her dead ex-best friend's eyes. And it just makes for the best harmony for the suffering of losing someone that you once found so dear. Lastly, but certainly not least, we have Dig. The most ominous sounding book, unless you have this garbage new cover that has that weird blurb on it. Not this one. This one is awesome and perfectly encapsulates what the book is about. You see, the heart of the family is the potato farms. That's how they've gotten filthy rich. There's just one catch though. All of the kids and grandkids are estranged from the family and living quite average to quite terrible lives. This story ambitiously follows six, count them, six characters' points of view. And the craziest thing is, is that the vast majority of this book, these characters are nameless. They just go by nicknames given to them by themselves or society. Names like The Freak or Can I Help You or First Class Malcolm. And the thing is, it totally works. Thinking you would be estranged or disassociated from these nameless characters, you're not. You grow to love them as you watch them go through their mundane existences. You get to see them shoveling snow or putting on a flea circus for themselves or working a drive-through. I'm making this sound super boring, but the thing is, is that A.S. King is really good at bringing something special out of these ordinary moments. The building up of characters is done so smooth, which is so hard to do with six points of view. This is all leading up to the twist. The twist of why on earth they're no longer part of the family anymore. I'll say the other thing I really like about A.S. King as a writer is her ability as a pantser. No, I'm not talking about somebody who pulls down someone else's clothes. In writing, there's a spectrum about how you go about scripting your book. On one side, you have planners. These are the people that go ahead and create outlines and backstories some of them even create new languages, all before writing a chapter of their novel. I say that I'm more skewed towards being a planner, but I'm a little in between. I like to know where my story will begin and end, and I'll write 10 chapters without even thinking about every detail. But from then on, I'll plot out five chapters at a time making sure that they're consistent from my beginning to my end while still keeping the novel fresh. Amy, from what I've heard, is a complete pantser, somebody who solely writes by the seat of their pants. She doesn't go in with an outline or anything. She just thinks about her characters and then asks, what are you gonna do next? How will that affect and change your life and the story we're telling. This makes for a very unique and satisfying read. I once read that she cried when she wrote the twist that happens in Please Ignore Vera Deeds because she was just as shocked to find out the heart-wrenching twists as the characters were 
when she was writing those words, and I could totally see that reading her books. There comes climaxes and epiphanies that come across as so unforced and natural that you can't help but think that these are ordinary moments as well as something utterly extraordinary. I've started incorporating more unique voices and perspectives in my work and let go of the reins a little bit on being so much of a planner. I think it could at least be an exercise in your writing arsenal, if not a full-on shift. Moreover, in real life, this has helped me look at people in a more compassionate way. I've become more empathetic as I see my characters develop bad habits and flaws that I wouldn't have given them otherwise. Instead of seeing your characters as a way to get from point A to point B in your novel, you get to see them for who they really are, even if it's a plot-driven book. I think anyone struggling to see their characters completely will really get some help from Amy's process. So thank you if you've stuck with me to the end. And thank you, A.S. King. Please keep your awesome, intense love for coming up with some of the most unique novels I know. Thanks for putting out there. What are you going to do next? How will that affect and change your life and the story we're telling? Thank you for always asking.